I'm a local girl, really, where Diamond Light Source is concerned, but my first memories of the site are from before the synchrotron there was even conceived. I had the stabilizers off my bike for the first time on the side roads, um, on the site between the road and where Diamond now stands. There are avenues of horse chestnut trees, and that's where my father took me to learn to ride. He was working on the site, so from early childhood, it was, it was normal for us that science was being done on a big scale at Harwell. I think a, a scientific career path was always there as an example. When I was growing up, my father was a chemist. He did his degree at Oxford, and after time working in the States, he then had a job on the Harwell site for years. Nothing to do with the synchrotron, but he was working in that kind of environment. And my grandfather before him, he also did chemistry or chemical engineering. So yes, there was definitely a legacy there. It's interesting looking back and reflecting. I never imagined myself, um, for myself, going into a physical sciences based career. Um, I, I assumed I'd travel, I assumed I'd do something a bit different. I wasn't sure what it was. My imagination was very much caught by the possibility of being an archaeologist because I loved history, I loved physics, I loved art, I still do. And archaeology looked like a way of combining all three areas. I mean, when you're at school, it's incredibly hard to understand the breadth of opportunity that's out there. We're being pigeonholed by careers advisors who are saying, oh, this is the area for you, or this. And part of it was about keeping options open and being able to work across the disciplines. I didn't have the language to articulate it like that when I was at school, but that was what was happening. And so I did uh, my work experience at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. I learned about that sector. I learned a lot about anthropology and some of the challenges around in that space. But what really inspired me about archaeology, looking back, was the geophys aspects. It was what you saw in Time Team, where they had a scanner and they were working across the ground and they were able to identify not just you know, the metal detecting side of things where there might be a buried hoard, but they could see where buildings and structures were under the surface. And they weren't having to dig to get to it. They could retrieve that information from the surface scanning. And it was that side of things and how they were doing those measurements that caught my imagination. The drive to do archaeology was certainly still there even when I picked my A-levels. It was history, it was art, physics and maths. But the physics I was really curious about and I knew that physics wasn't something that I would study for fun. Not to knock it as a subject, but I sensed that of all the things I was interested in, it was the one that I needed to study in a formal way at university if I was to be able to use it. Two physics degrees later and I was beginning to think about what I was going to do next and I was uh, just at the point where I'd submitted my PhD in 2002 and it was materials physics so it was very much about analysing what was there, trying to understand the structures, pulling on the themes of what, what had interested me in archaeology except in this case I was looking at metal alloys and their structures. And I'd learned a very wide range of techniques during my PhD because the one instrument that I really needed was to be able to, I needed to be able to do neutron diffraction at a source, it was in France. And the particular instrument I needed was closed just as I started my PhD for extended refurbishment. And so I developed a lot of different analytical skills in order to be able to look at the problem tangentially. And in the final stages of my PhD, I attended a seminar in the physics department, one of our routine seminars at Warwick, and it was by Professor John Dobson from Keele University. So he was a researcher from Florida who would established a group at Keele looking at magnetics and biomagnetics. And what really struck me during that seminar was that he was looking at human brain. He was looking at disease and aging and he was looking at how the way that we normally manage iron stores within the body appeared to shift in the context of epilepsy and potentially as a function of aging, they needed to work out the baseline. And the measurements that they were doing on human brain 
we're using the set of techniques that I've been using for completely unrelated work in my PhD. And that really inspired me to see if I could create an opportunity to work in that space with the techniques. And I sat there in the seminar, think, getting more and more excited, thinking, I could do this. I, th this is something I never dreamt was open to me. And um, can I find a way to work on this? And if memory serves me right, I, I went straight from the seminar, printed out, I just had my first paper published, prove I was a bona fide researcher, that I, I, I had um, potential as a postdoctoral researcher. And I, I, I followed him down the corridor with the paper and said, please, I'm, I'm really interested in doing research as a postdoc. And do you have any opportunities in your group at the moment at Kiel? He was incredibly supportive. We worked together to develop some grant proposals that I could put forward as fellowships until I got funding. Alzheimer's Society invested in me. Um, they took a chance on me as somebody with no knowledge of Alzheimer's, no biology track record in that area, no neuroscience track record. And they supported me um, through various resources and um, collaborations to be able to build the foundations of what we do today. As a PhD student, I had the chance to use the synchrotron facility in Grenoble and that gave me an insight into the culture there and, and the opportunities. But as a postdoctoral researcher, I started using the synchrotron in a very different way. I was working as part of a, a team that had uh, collaborative access to the advanced photon source at the Argonne Labs near Chicago. And when we were working at that beam line, I was a early career postdoctoral researcher. I was part of a team led from University of Florida. And the chemical engineer who was the, the lead for this, he openly spoke about this beamline as his tinker toy set. It was an extremely sophisticated one. But in essence, we were going in, we were doing the first micro-focused X-ray experiments on this class of tissue. And to make it work, we needed to take this beam, and the X-ray beam incoming, and get it focused down. So we were always having to start every experiment by setting up the equipment in order to get the beam focused. And we'd usually spend 12 hours getting set up in order to start measuring. So we'd be coming out the next morning very hungry, the sun would be coming up, and we'd have spent the night trying to find the microfocus mirrors, which cupboard they'd been left in, getting it all set up and running. And everything was command prompt driven as well. So you had to type everything in and you couldn't afford to make a mistake. So it was an incredible training experience. And it's, it's really unusual now to get that level of hands-on experience of understanding how to make that kind of experiment work. And when I subsequently came to Diamond Light Source as a user in 2007, 2008, and so I'd ask questions like, so where, you know, where do I control the, the mirrors to change the focal point? No, you don't. I said, oh, okay, so how's that? And actually it was fantastic in terms of Having a stable environment, it meant I couldn't touch the mirrors anymore and I wasn't expected to be adjusting things too much at the beamline because if I did that, I was potentially going to break it. But it was brilliant to have that deep insight into how it was all working and then to go into an environment where we could just chill. It was much more efficient, but I, I'm still very glad I had that training in, in the Argonne Labs. So we're working at a really interesting intersection between the disciplines. We're essentially doing material science of the brain. We're using synchrotron x-rays to give us access to information about the chemistry and the, the mineral structures, the crystal structures that form when we're managing metals in the brain. The kinds of questions we're addressing about metals and their role in the brain and their role in neurodegenerative disorders, those kinds of questions would traditionally be asked in a histology lab. But there's a sticking point where there are certain questions you just can't answer with the lab-based methods. The synchrotron's giving us a level of sensitivity and specificity to what's there that we can't get with other methods unless we destroy the sample. And the whole point about what we do is that we layer up information. We can ask lots of different questions of a sample so that we can build up a picture of what's there. And that helps us understand what targets are there to detect disease earlier, to understand more about the, the processes that are happening in the disease. So are these metals relevant to the way that the disease is progressing and the toxicity that's, that's associated here? 
and also to help us understand whether the way that we acquire the metals matters. So dietary uptake is very tightly regulated. We wouldn't usually assume that having more or less of something is going to have a huge impact on what's in the brain, for example, so that's really well regulated, but in disease that might change. And if we're acquiring particles from the environment around us through routes that aren't um, ones that we're necessarily so evolved to manage, so for example, if we've got um, workplace exposure to a particular metal or if there's environmental exposure to um, airborne pollution, understanding the impact of that is also something that we're, we're quite focused on. So in Alzheimer's disease, there are some, some key hallmarks that would be used to classify um, post-mortem to identify when somebody's had Alzheimer's disease. And one of the key hallmarks is um, amyloid plaques. So the protein deposits that form in the brain and see them under the microscope, they've been known for, for a century or so. What we're looking at is the influence that that aggregating protein, that amyloid beta, has on certain metals. And so with iron, we can see that the iron chemistry is changed by the aggregating protein. And the way in which it's changed, changed has consequences for the toxicity of the iron. It's a form of rust, in effect, the rust nanoparticles that we all make, um, that living systems make to store iron. And we're seeing the form of that, the mineral form, change. And the most startling discovery that we've made in recent years has been that the peptide, when it's aggregating, can change it to a pure metal form, not even an oxide anymore. And so if you've got an accumulation in a part of the brain, and that's potentially precursor to the damage that you see in the disease, can you see it earlier? Can you get a chance to detect that change in the individual, that chemical change? And so one of the ways you might pick that up with iron is with an MRI scanner in a clinic. And so ideally, if you've got changes in the way that your iron stores are, are being managed, and that's a precursor to disease, you could go and have a scan for it. But in practice, when you have an MRI scan, there's lots of signal that's being collected. The iron can influence the signal, but so can lots of other things. So how would you validate that? And so we've been using the synchrotron to look at tissues with magnetic resonance imaging microscopy, and to then look at where the metals are in the tissues to validate the signal that can be seen clinically. Because you can't take a biopsy from a person who's gone into the clinic in that way. You can't do a brain biopsy. But you can look post-mortem to make sure that the source of signal is being interpreted correctly. Reflecting back on what excited me about a potential career in archaeology and metal detecting and understanding what's below the surface, the way we use the synchrotron to look at human tissues today, we're essentially doing metal detecting. It's super sensitive, but we're doing metal detecting, we're look at, looking at the structures. So in a way, it is archaeology of the human brain when we're looking at these post-mortem samples. And a lot of the ideas about without damaging or disrupting the sample, being able to visualize what's in there and build up a picture of what's below the surface, that is very much what we do with the methods that we're, we're developing today. There are open questions about the impact of airborne pollution in particular. There have been news stories about exposure in certain environments to types of metal nanoparticles that we might be inhaling, might be taking through other routes as well. And to understand how, how is that going to impact public policy going forward? How can we give advice as a society to people living every day with various levels of exposure and risk if we don't understand the impact of those particles and the way they're being handled within the human brain. So that's where the synchrotron is giving us a unique set of tools to be able to work on this problem and answer questions about what's happening to particles when they're taken up into the body, when they're trafficked in tissues, how are they changed, are they broken down, are they sites of toxicity or are they um, excreted effectively? And those are the kinds of things that we can study with the synchrotron. We can look for a needle in a haystack with the synchrotron. We can, we can look at a sample without destroying it. We can get amazing, specific, 
sensitive, precise analytical information from samples with synchrotrons in a way that we couldn't with other methods. So it's opened up all kinds of ways of measuring that we've been able to take forward and develop. So it's incredibly powerful as a tool for our research. It gives us essentially label-free imaging of trace metals in really complex human samples. Um, so it's fantastic in that regard, in terms of what it's brought to our research. But it's also the, the work that's gone on in the synchrotron community over the decades. That's driving laboratory instrument innovation. So things that we couldn't dream of doing within our laboratory 10 years ago are becoming a reality. It doesn't replace what the synchrotron can do for us, but it does mean that there are measurements we can now do for ourselves in the laboratory with certain instruments going forward to, to make sure that we can keep making progress on something even though we don't have access to the synchrotron 24 7. So we can use the synchrotron in a more dedicated way for those things that we can't study otherwise in the lab. Another thing I think is really important about the way that synchrotron science is done is that it's essentially a, a, a giant open source international project because people are coming together from throughout the scientific community to look at how we can make measurements better. If I was to buy a laboratory instrument and want extra functionality on it, I'd likely be waiting for the next iteration of the instrument and then reinvesting and replacing. But a beamline is completely different because there's this partnership between the science community, the instrument builders, the scientists at the synchrotrons to keep this evolving in response to need and to keep improving what's there. And so that's been really unusual uh, compared to most of the analytical science that one would do. And being part of that bigger project has been very special. I also think it goes beyond the instrumentation. It goes beyond the technical measurement side of things because for people who are users of synchrotron facilities, the networks that are there, the problem-solving approaches that are there mean that for someone who enters into a career and they're a synchrotron user, it transcends the institutions that they work at. They've got this network and the people that they meet, the networks that they form can really underpin careers the, and, and be a, a foundation for what they do going forward. The, it's the oversight they get of what's going on in the community, the access to ideas and to what's becoming possible, being right at that interface of what's possible in terms of measurement science. So I think it's, it's a really, it's the value of the synchrotron and the synchrotron community goes far beyond the actual measurement process itself.